Welcome to 6.5 on the Road. I'm Keith Kirkpatrick, Research Director with the Futurum Group, and welcome to Pega World 2025. Today I'm joined by two of our guests. Hi, I'm Tara DeZeo, Senior Director of One-to-One -one Customer Engagement for Product Marketing. And I'm Peter van der Putten. I'm a Director of Pega's AI Lab and Pega's Lead Scientist. Well, thanks both of you for joining me here today. So we were talking last year, so much has changed since we were here you know, a year ago. Uh, obviously, we're talking a lot about AI agents, but before we even get into that and talking about all the great things that Pega is doing, why don't we just start off by talking about sort of where are we going with AI? Peter, maybe you could just give a little color in terms of where we are and where we're going. Yeah, like, well, ooh, a big question, of course. Um, uh, you know, w one of the things that I think uh, we have an, as an overarching theme that, that, you know, should be a little bit longer lasting than just the latest AI hype, is the, this idea of the autonomous enterprise, right? It says like, hey, if you can have autonomous cars uh, that, you know, where, you know, the driver's in charge, you 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 give the, the car your goals where you want to go, the car actually gets you there, gets to work for you, right? Why can't we have autonomous enterprises that do the same, that apply AI and automation to self-optimize towards certain business goals? And I think that's, that's pretty much kind of an overarching uh, vision um, that is still, I think, relevant, maybe even more so, you know, like if you then take in some of these latest developments like AI agents, right. it's very much geared towards how, how can we have, a, have an AI that plays a somewhat more active role, right? So uh, uh, um, rather than being some kind of passive AI that we need to write prompts to, mm -hmm. uh, it's an AI that gets to work for us and gets us to our, our, our destination. Right. Well, one of the other things, though, that I think is, is particularly important now is we're hearing a lot about, you know, having more context to kind of drive these decisions that go on with AI. So it's not sort of like if you think back, you know, five or 10 years ago where you had, you, know, you would interact with the system and you would get a very static response. Today, it seems like it is all about context and relevancy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then uh, we're giving a bit more responsibility to the AI, like, why don't you, uh, I can give you, I can give you some form of instruction, but right. you know it could be you know you can count on it on, on being vague, not like a very exact prompt, but just a, a high level goal that I want to achieve, and then you need to sort it out. So, and of course, agentic AI is capable to tap into like you give it various kind of knowledge sources or data sources or even actions it could take, and it can figure out to to kind of first collect more context mm -hmm. to then figure out what it is that it needs to do. Right, right. Now, Tara, you know, this all sounds great, but it, it isn't quite that simple when you actually deploy it within sure. the enterprise, right? I mean, there's, there's other things that, can, that, that organizations really need to consider, correct? Well, you know, clients are at a different stage of maturity, right? So we have some clients that are like fully autonomous or on their way to being fully autonomous. And then right. we have some that are still stuck in traditional manual processes. So sure. it's really, you know, depends on the pace of transformation of the business, right? Okay. Right. So if you're a company that perhaps hasn't been sort of on the cutting edge, what's sort of the first thing, though, that, that organizations need to consider? Is it their data? Is it their people? Is it processes or, or a combination yeah. thereof? It's a combination. I would say that what you want to consider first is what outcomes you're trying to drive to mm. for the business right. and then work backwards. Hmm. Data is foundational to AI. So, right. you know, that would be, for me, the thing you should focus on after you know, no yeah. business outcomes. Yeah, no, though I really like that you say, hey, start with the business outcomes first, right? Because, um, you know, like uh, you could say, well, let's fix our data problems first. Well, we that that mantra we heard like probably also five years, and right. 10 yeah. years and yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. But so it's very good. I think it's very healthy what you say, Tara, like start, start with the problems that you try to resolve, right? So and what kind of outcomes you want to drive and uh, like, uh, yeah, work, work, work back from there, you know? Right. Yeah, you know, be it, pragmatic a little bit about that. Right. Yeah. Is there a, a situation though where if you're thinking about outcomes, do you, is there a need to really consider, you know, overall outcomes for, you know, the entire business instead of looking at it from a siloed approach? Because I think that's where sometimes organizations can say, I want to improve one little thing here, but really when we're talking about generative AI or AI as a whole, really to really get a lot of value it needs to be something that is applied across the whole business right 
Yeah, I would say that there's, again, different stages of maturity for that, right? Because we have organizations that have like AI governance boards okay. where they make decisions together across functional areas. Mm -hmm. And then we have, you know, a lot of organizations working in silos still. So hmm. it's, uh, yeah. yeah, it's not. I think it's also, also depends maybe on the, on the actual function, right? So let's say you're more into uh, business operations, right? Or customer operations. I've, for sure, there can be actually be you know particular use cases where you know some solve an agent that solves some particular need is fine you know like uh, let's right. say uh, uh, first notice of loss at an insurance company you know there's lots of opportunities there to improve that particular process right. and there's less of a need to say oh it needs to be kind of coordinated with everything in the company but if you take another example let's say if it's more about customer engagement uh, one to one. Uh, interactions with your customers, yeah, there's, yeah, I don't know. I don't think you should do that kind of in some form of a siloed manner where you say, well, I'm just gonna, fo I'm a bank, I'm just gonna focus on credit cards, right? There's right. no way, you know, like in the moment, yeah, I think you would need to have to consider everything that's in play, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, some certainly something that we've found in our research is this idea that there is sort of uh, a, the, the organizations that are successful either have a center of excellence mm -hmm. or they're taking a very top-down approach so they can do things in a coordinated manner and then perhaps build on success in one area and kind of try to replicate at, at the very least the process or the iterative process going forward. But you know I'd like to move slightly over to you know kind of what, what is PEGA doing to really help organizations go from that sort of hey I have this idea that I want to improve the outcomes here or there wherever it might be and actually getting on that road? You know, I would say that our blueprint tools are probably, you know, yeah. the way to really understand how you can transform before you do it. Right. So we have a customer engagement blueprint and we have platform blueprint. Okay. One is for developers and workflow automation. Mm -hmm. One is for marketers and customer engagement practitioners. Right. And that's a way to visualize where you want to take your organization is by blueprinting your strategies and yep. blueprinting your applications. Right. I mean, I got to play around with that last year when it was released and then, uh, you know, looking at it again this year, it sounds like there's also some really, some really interesting new enhancements there as well. There is, yeah, and it's one of those tools where that we're constantly iterating on. So, you know, it, you might have a new thing two weeks after you've logged in, right. and yeah. it looks different than the weeks previous. So, it's right. yeah. something yeah. that has a lot of development behind it. Yeah, like say, I can, I can talk maybe about like more the workflow blueprint, and you can maybe talk more yeah. about one to one. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so. Uh, on the, uh, I think indeed, uh, the, on the on the workflow uh, side of the house, um, uh, and yes, we're releasing every week. Uh, but I think we are uh, more and more focusing also on what are the different types of inputs that you can put into that process. It all started with that you would just type, a, you know, uh, like a little prompt where you say, "I want to develop an application for first notice of loss," right? Mm -hmm. Um, but where we're extending it is that you, there might be situations, especially in legacy transformation, where there's a lot more uh, background context. And maybe there's some mainframe application that people are already using today, right? So you could have uh, the training materials that you give to a new agent, and you give those training materials as input, or maybe a little uh, video of a walkthrough demo of that, that legacy application. Or maybe you've taken tools from um, you know, the, the tools from AWS or from Google uh, that do, that can automatically kind of uh, um, extract uh, functional descriptions from code. And so there's a lot more than a richer multimodal set of inputs right. that you can give, uh, that you can use as input into your blueprinting uh, process. Like how should I then re-envision those processes in a modern app like, uh, like Pega? And that allows you to also, yeah, not, not not just use it to ideate uh, yeah particular new use cases but really take take into account a lot of background context which is particularly important for legacy transformation right and then i think yeah on the one to one side yeah we have some very cool new developers around kind of multi agent types type uh, uh, use of uh, 
uh, well, multiple agents that work together to right. create a blueprint, but Terra yeah. mode yes. uh, is much better uh, position than I am. It's, I mean, it's really similar in terms of the inputs. Right. So, you know, we started out with uh, Blueprint being able to take your brand identity mm -hmm. from your website, and yep. now essentially you'll be able to input your brand guidelines, potentially creative brief, mm -hmm. you, you know, data sets, and really activate what your customer journeys could look like. And then I think the end state, you know, down, down the roadmap is being able to extract insights out of customer decision hub mm -hmm. and back into blueprint. That would right. be the end state that I we would that. want to, you know, develop. To. So it's, it's almost like a cyclical thing that's ongoing yes. to constantly improve a continuous yeah. improvement. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah, right. yeah, but with, with different kind of design agents that working together, like uh, right. maybe there's a marketing analyst agent that, that takes that context and information from your, you know, your existing running system to see, okay, where are we now, you know? Uh, and then there's maybe a strategy agent that determines like, hey, what is the key problem that we need to focus on? And that's being used combined and both as a brief to a bunch of creative agents, you know, that has happy, you know, creative uh, creatures, <laughs> yes. create all kinds of nice outputs. Right. And then of course you have the brand police that goes like, well, uh, hang on, you right. know, like yes. uh, that's, right. uh, these are nice outputs, but here you need to, Focus more on the, uh, you know, the right um, tone of voice, for yes. example, that right. or our, our, you know, our brand personality, or maybe even a legal compliance agent mm -hmm. that says like, hey, you know, uh, it's great that you're offering a 10% discount, but, uh, but that's not, uh, it's not going to happen, yeah, right? Yeah. So. Well, that's, you know, you bring up a really important part, which is one of the reasons why I think there's been some reluctance to utilize generative AI in large organizations is because they are afraid about things like hallucination and things going off the rails. But what it sounds like you're able to do with this, with Blueprint, is make sure that you can utilize the power and the creativity of, say, generative AI, but you're still doing that within a framework of you know, established workflows and making sure that you don't have something that's out of policy or, or completely not uh, an output that you, that you would be happy with as an organization. Well, you, you, know, you do have that control. There right. is human control. So right. if, for example, creative comes back and we heard Rob Walker today on the main stage yep. talking about something having an extra finger. If something yes. comes, comes yes. back with an extra finger, the human can say, okay, this is not what we're looking for. You right. know, please yeah. fix it. Right. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, in that sense, uh, a lot of um, uh, organizations are talking about like, uh, oh, we'll have these agents at runtime, but don't forget there's like a big opportunity to use these, these agents at design time. In this right. case, to design your workflows or to design your uh, uh, customer engagement uh, strategies, uh, because then, then you have the human in the loop in terms of approval, et cetera, et cetera. That said, of course, there is also an opportunity to uh, yeah, uh, to use these agents at runtime. Uh, with that, I mean, it's like I'm, I'm in the middle of this first notice of loss, you crash your car, uh, you're right. giving me a call. Uh, but there as well, we really focus on uh, how, how can you ground these agents into an ecosystem right. of existing workflows, existing business rules, existing policies that, that need to be applied as opposed to like, oh, we'll just leave it to the LLM, we'll right. just leave it to the agent, right? So I think that's um, oh, uh, because we were, that, that's something that we've been focusing on forever, pre-agents as well. Uh, how do we deal with, uh, in the workflow area, how do we deal with uh, straight through workflow or orchestrating people doing work or orchestrating between the two of them or inserting smart decisions? Uh, we're always in this environment where, um, um, yeah, you need to orchestrate across all of that and it needs to be audited and regulated right. and, and, and whatnot. So that's, that happens to be the perfect ecosystem for agents to right. exist in because we can ground them in all these other kind of, yeah, uh, like I said, workflows, business rules, what, uh, integrations, data source, whatever is there with proper governance uh, on top. You know, what I'm hearing, you know, with all of this, with the platform, is it really addresses two things that are, I think are top of mind uh, for organizations. One, of course, is time to value, mm -hmm. because organizations waste so much time, you know, you know, whether it's ideating, planning, testing, piloting, going back again, something falls off. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, ultimately, it's the ROI puzzle. You know, it, it sounds like that is, you know, underlying, that is, you know, two of the things that it really, that the platform is able to really support is improvements on both of those. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at least for a customer decision hub, you can reach time to value in six months, yep. which is very quick. And, um, you know, that includes generating revenue, but also saving on operations. Right. So. Yeah. And outcomes are not also something uh, fluffy at a high level. You know, it's really uh, uh, at the level of an individual interaction. I open up my mobile app right now and then recommendations are being made and I can actually see did the customer actually like that recommendation? Did the customer click on it, accept it, whatnot? And that's in the marketing space, but uh, also in the workflow space, uh, because we orchestrate that entire process, we also know how long it takes. And not just for the entire process, but every stage and step. We also know what was the final outcome, but also the intermediate outcomes during that process, right? So this outcome orientation is not just something macro and high level, uh, we, we do that as part of every single interaction, as part of every single process execution. Right. We're able to track these outcomes. And, and that also means that then on the fly, you can steer towards doing the right thing yeah, and optimize towards those outcomes. So that brings it then back to this idea of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the autonomous enterprise. Well, I really appreciate both of your thoughts on, on what we've heard here at Pega World 2025. Uh, I think I did this last year. I just want to ask, where do you think we're going to go between now and next June? And I'll throw it out to both of you. Yeah, I mean, for marketers, I think we're going to start seeing, um, you know, we've been promising them to simplify MarTech stacks for years and years. Right. And I think we might actually start to see that because for the first year ever, uh, you know, I track the state of MarTech through different reports and such. Right. We, we didn't have double digit vendor growth this year for the first time wow. in about 10 years. So I think we're going to start seeing some market consolidation. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I think uh, any AI space, AI and workflow space, we'll, we'll actually continue to see consolidation as well, yeah. funnily enough, in more in the underlying Gen AI services, right? So better, faster, cheaper Gen AI models. Uh, I think don't underestimate the Google, you know, that we've seen that, uh, like uh, it's no longer that open AI is just a, uh, you know, the, the single best uh, solution on the market and likewise from AWS or other vendors. So I think that will continue to commoditize that market through this hyper competitive nature, which is good, right. which actually also then implies that, that most of the values in the application layer on top, right? So people like Andrew Ong, they have said the same thing, the application layer uh, where AI and automation comes together that's the, 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 the sweet spot, you know, guess, guess where we are <laughs> exactly there, right? So, uh, but your question was then more what's, what's gonna happen. Uh, I think, yeah, well, we'll see that commoditization at the bottom. Yep. I think we'll see more maturity in that application layer because people were first focusing on the cool kits, you know, like uh, just having some agent toolkit and build something from scratch. And, but these enterprises that, that are here, you know, big banks, telcos, governments, organizations, they, they, they're not greenfield organizations, right? So they're looking more for, um, uh, in this example, than agentic systems that are embedded into an ecosystem uh, with all these regulations and workflows that are already out there, right? So I think that's, that's also a sign of maturity at a more, more, the more mature enterprise use of, uh, of, of agents. And uh, I expect that next year in this conference, uh, we'll have you know uh, at least half of the breakouts. People will be presenting real agentic yeah. use cases that they brought to life. So. All right, all right. Well, then we'll leave it there, and uh, we'll check back in next year at Pega World. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks thank, a lot. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. I've been Keith Kirkpatrick at the Futurum Group, and we'll see you all next year. <laughs>